Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. If you haven't seen that movie, you're wondering why I showed a drunk man. <laughs> so if you've seen that movie, you know that he got to see what life would have been like when he wasn't around. And uh, maybe if you've never seen, how many of you have never seen, I'm going to embarrass you on purpose, and we don't embarrass people here, but you've never seen any part of It's a Wonderful Life? Other than that part, so. <laughs> All right. Well, it's on TV, and if you Google it, I don't know what to tell you. A phenomenal movie, very long, old movie, two hours and 20 minutes. So feel free to fast forward through a few parts. Um, but it ties into today's message, because here's the truth, listen. When you obey God, life is easy. No. When you obey God, sometimes life is more difficult. And so I want to ask you a question today to start the service. I want you to think about this. If you were God, what would you change in your life? If you were God and you could just change anything, would it be a sickness in your life? Would it be the loss of a loved one? Would it maybe be a situation with your family? Would it be, what would... Katie, can you keep your praise team under control? <laughs> Every week, they're up here with like bags of candy, and I don't know what's going on. All right. So if you were God, one of the things I would change is I would take away every piece of food from the praise team and make them go outside to eat. Anyway, so, so but let me ask you this, seriously. So, so what is it that you would change? You know, maybe it would be your job. Maybe it would be, you know, I'd go, I would have gone to school, or I would have not gone to school, or I would have joined the military, or I would have joined the military, or I would have done this job instead, or I would have lived here instead, or, you know, you ever, you ever think what, what could have happened and what would have happened? How about the world? What would you change in the world? What would you fix? What, what do you think would make things better? So, so I'm going to just give you a clue before I start the message. It's very simple today. You're not God. And I'm not God. I try to give God recommendations quite often. I have ideas for him. But let me give you one of my ideas for Christmas, okay? God, you realize that if you had told Joseph first before Mary, it would have made it much easier on Mary, right? I, I just I have some little things, just little things to make life just come on God, can't you make life a little easier? Can't you have Peter walk on water when it's not windy? <laughs> I mean, when I want to walk on water, what? I, okay, God, let me schedule it. I like early in the morning when it's nice and flat, <laughs> and uh, and no disciples around because they'll make fun of me, right? So you can imagine when Peter got back in the boat, it was probably you know Thomas probably said, yeah, I told you not to get out there, you know, that, right? And, and yet, God has ways of working in our lives. And when we trust Him, we find peace. Five years ago on this day, I started having diverticulitis. I, they discovered diverticulitis. I thought I had a kidney stone. And it's interesting because I actually looked at one of my status today and it basically said, thank you to the people at Surfside who've been bringing my kids food, which meant I wasn't eating. I didn't eat from before Thanksgiving Till about a real meal till about the end of January. Um, so just imagine that. And during that time, I also didn't, I was not allowed to drink anything or have ice chips or even those little things they give you to keep your tongue wet. There was a time in the hospital that I couldn't even have that. So I spent almost 30 days in the hospital. I came home with a wound back. If you don't know what that is, and if you're grossed out in the morning, you might want to hold your ears for this next part. I came home, they actually had to do two sets of the sponges. They, they have sponges that they put inside. They had to open two different sets from two different packages because the wound was so deep, you could have literally put your hand inside of me. And I showed up for church with a little thing that looked like a, a uh, pump for a uh, fish tank. It actually sounded like that. And I preached uh, with suspenders because there was no way uh, uh, to keep my pants up because I had lost so much weight. And had this little thing on the whole time during church, I heard. <laughs> I don't know about you. I would have loved to not have that lesson. You know, one of the little things, and just a little thing that I learned, I learned about this stuff. Now, 
If you're like me and, and you have hairy arms and you go to the hospital and you're going to be there any length of time, it's not fun. I believe the most painful thing I went to was not the surgeries, not the operations, not where they cut me open. It was the nurses pulling the tape off of my arm. Yeah. <laughs> and one of the nurses came in and all of a sudden she said, oh, I'm going to just put this on. She sprayed this stuff and she went, whoop. And I went, what is that? <laughs> and she said, well, it's really expensive. And I was thinking, whatever, $100? I don't care. She said, it's $20. So I got online, and from then on, when I went back to the hospital, by the way, I had to go back to the hospital. I don't even, it's countless times. It's over 30 different days. I would take this with me. <laughs> when the nurse would come in and go, I'm going to get, who is this? <laughs> and they would go, oh, I like this. What is this? And I'd say, it's expensive. And they go, eh, it's all right. It's just a lot of people. <laughs> even in trial, you learn things. You discover things, you know things. It was it was so bad that one time I went back for another surgery and one of the nurses said, You work here, right? And I just, just hear a lot. Just hear a lot. I want to encourage you when you're going through tough times, you will almost always feel like quitting right before your breakthrough. You will almost always be at your lowest before God answers prayer. Well, by the way, he always answers prayer. It's not always, always the way we want. We will have to get to the point sometimes when we know that, God, I'm going to trust you. I don't know how far. When I was in the hospital, I remember the day that I finally said, I've been in the hospital for weeks and weeks. And I remember sitting there and, and thinking of the verse where it says, we are his vessels. And I said, you know, God, I'm your vessel. And if you want to put me on the shelf, because at that time I wasn't even sure I was ever getting out of bed. I said, God, if you want to put me on the shelf, then that's up to you because you're God and I'm not. And I believe for all of us, when God doesn't do things the way we expect, which is what we're going to start with today, we have stages. And we're going to see this with Mary in this passage about the Messiah being born, we first start out kind of dazed when God doesn't do what we want. We're just kind of like, what? You know, when the doctor said, I'm going to have to put you in the hospital, I'm like, what? My first thing was, am I going to miss a Sunday? He's thinking, are you going to live through it? I'm like, am I going to miss the weekend? i got to get somebody to cover for me. That's a bummer, right? We're dazed. We don't, we don't understand. And then we get disturbed. It's, it's more, we get even more upset and frustrated and sometimes just puzzled. It's why would God let this happen? And then it even gets more difficult. We find difficulty, and if we're honest, sometimes we make it more difficult because of our attitude, because of the way we look at things. And then we finally get to the point. If we're going to trust him, we will depend on him for strength. So I'm going to talk about those four things this morning, look at that story, and then I'm going to talk about how you and I can learn to rest in his peace, release our pace of life, how our speed we want, and then I'm going to talk about how you can relax. Some of you need to relax, knowing that he is preparing all for your good. So let's start with this idea of we are dazed. Number one, when God doesn't answer prayers the way we want, we're dazed. In the sixth month, God sent an angel, Gabriel, to Nazareth. By the way, Gabriel, awesome angel, Old Testament, went to see Daniel. This is kind of like the next time we see him. And uh, he prophesied the Messiah, and then he shows up for the Messiah. I can hear God saying, it's time. So he goes down, and he says, a town of Galilee to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. And I meant to put this verse in, so forgive me. I'm going to read it to you. In verse 34, very soon, Mary says, how will this be since I'm a virgin? She was dazed. She was sitting there thinking, what, what, what was going to happen? When you go through something tough, a lot of times we're dazed. We try to figure out, I feel cursed. I feel like I've done something wrong. I feel like I messed something up, and yet the angel comes to her, and the first thing he says, before he tells her the news, he says, congratulations, you are highly favored. Now, it wouldn't be long she wouldn't feel very favored. 
You know why she knew she was favored? Because for her, it wasn't about her. Now, obviously, I've never had a baby. <laughs> I've had kidney stones, which I hear are close, but not quite the same, right? And so, and so, but, but I've been told over and over by women that, not that they forget the pain, but they want to put up with the pain again in order to have a child. Yes. Now, no father, by the way, looks at children that way. They're like, no, that wouldn't be worth it. <laughs> not only that, she knew that she was fulfilling what God wanted. I'm so sorry, Pastor. I need um, Logan's bomb. Sorry. It's okay. You know they can actually put that on the screen real small. <laughs> you don't have to walk through the whole service. <laughs> Next time I'll just say Logan's mom and just leave the board to <laughs> I'm not easily distracted. <laughs> Here's what I want you to know. I don't know what's happening in your life, but if you're a Christian, you are blessed. If you're a Christian, did you hear me? If you're a believer, you're blessed. You may feel cursed right now. You may have had grown up with parents who told you you were a burden. They may have told you you were a problem, you were an issue. You may have teachers who said, oh, you are so whatever, and said negative things to you. And over and over in your head, you hear those things, and you have to remember that God says that you are blessed. Because here's the deal. Knowing that you're blessed gives you hope. Christmas is about hope. The, all through the Old Testament, Jesus was prophesied to come. And now the reason we celebrate Christmas is because now he's here. And so we celebrate the hope that Messiah brings to forgive us because we all know we're messed up and broken and we're under a curse. But as soon as God forgives us, we receive his blessing. We receive the blessings of God. Before we go any further, would you remind the person next to you that they're blessed? Just say, you are blessed. Go ahead. If nothing else, they're blessed to just be sitting next to you. <laughs> so now that you've told them they're blessed, the second phase, one of the things we deal with, number two, we are disturbed. <laughs> Some of you are disturbed, but that's not what this is talking about, okay? The angel went to her and said, greetings, you who are highly favored. By the way, I didn't talk about this, but that's the word charis, that's the word for grace. It is the word we use for grace all the time. Hey, congratulations, you've got grace. And so anytime in life, you should realize, I've got grace, I've been given grace. Listen, we all need grace. If you walk around with a little list, writing down what's wrong with other people, can I guarantee that you'll be able to fill it on anybody you hang around? And if you live that way, you will be miserable. But if you walk around with a grace list, Knowing that broken and messed up and hurting people are loved by God, and you see those, listen, I know enough people, and enough people know me that I know they've got a list. But then we take the list and we go, God, thank you that you forgive even Eric for it. Just you let him be our pastor. I don't know why, but there it is, right? God, thank you that you love this person, even with their failures, even with their faults. And if you're in any kind of close relationship, you're going to see people's faults, and then you say, God, would you give me grace? He says, you are highly graced. You're blessed. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly, what's the next word? Troubled, troubled right here in River City. She was troubled. This word for troubled is a vision in Greek. Greek's a very picture language. It's the idea of water boiling. You ever have that when you're dealing with something? Like up front you're normal and everything seems okay, but you're like a duck. You know what a duck does, right? Duck's real still on top and underneath. And, and you're looking at everybody like, oh, I'm doing great. Everything is just fine. But the truth is, everything's not just fine. You're freaked out. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his word and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, do not be Afraid. By the way, angels said that all the time. There's only one time in the Bible that I know of where an angel did not tell a human to be afraid, and that was Balaam. The angel was mad at Balaam, showed up, and never said, don't be afraid. I believe every other time in Scripture when an angel shows up, it says, don't be afraid. You know why? Because angels don't fade in. 
<laughs> they don't have, what did that I see? You see something, no, it's, right? Every time, they're just there. Can you imagine sitting quietly in a room, you're sitting here, even in church with all the noise and things happening, and we're all here together, and then all of a sudden you realize there's somebody sitting next to you? I don't know about you, that would freak me out. One night I was running the bridge in Titusville, I'm running the bridge. Now, I run slow, apparently, but I didn't expect anybody to pass me on the bridge. There was nobody out there. It was 10 o'clock at night. I'm running the bridge, which is running the bridge, okay? And so I'm running the bridge, and all of a sudden I see a shadow. And I look over, and there is a guy literally right here, and he looked at me at the same time, and I went, ah! And he went, ah! And I went, ah! And we, just, then we both started laughing as he ran off. And then when we saw each other the other way, we just laughed. <laughs> so funny. He probably tells people that story all the time. You should see the idiot I walked up on. So you can imagine seeing an angel, and angels are awesome. They're not these little baby angels. They're these awesome creatures of God. Awesome. So he says, don't be afraid. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you're to call him Jesus. He will be great or be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he'll reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. He was giving him the prophecy, what it had said in the Old Testament. That prophecy is going to come true through you. Now, here's the deal. We're afraid when that happens. And if we're not careful, we think that having God's favor is about us. We think that God's favor is about our list. Our, we're Americans. So God's favor, we think, and TV preachers teach, it's about your new house. I actually heard a TV preacher yesterday saying, and then they just trusted God and he gave them a new house. I don't know about you, but when I read this story, they're, they're in a cave. No house. But they still have God's favor. If you don't have a new house, can I tell you something? You can still have God's favor. If you don't have a new car, can I tell you something? Your car breaks down and you're on the side of the road. You still have God's favor. Life is tough and things don't go well. You still have God's favor. God's favor is not about your possessions. God's favor is not about your health. God's favor is not about everything going great for you. And all of life is, la, 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 la. I got God's favor. No, no. God's favor is when life is hard and the storms are rolling and the wind is blowing and yet you're walking on water. But you have a choice. You can look at Jesus. Or you can look at the waves. You have God's favor. You have to say, God, I'm blessed, even when things are hard. And I don't know about you, I read this story, it doesn't follow our American idea of blessing. And yet, the angel tells her she's blessed. Did you know even how people think about why it impacts them? They've done studies of patients that are going in for surgery. And patients, they did a very specific study on gallbladder surgery, not a fun surgery. They, they did a very specific study on that. And patients who believed that they were going to be okay, that the surgery wasn't a big deal, tended to get out a day earlier out of the hospital. Just because how they thought about it. So often, as individuals, we go through life and we focus on the things that are wrong and we miss all the blessings around us. Do you realize Mary could have focused on everything that was wrong, but when you read Mary's song, you see that she didn't focus on herself. She focused on what God did in the past and what he's going to do in the future. And she was amazed that God would even use her in between. Some of you are lying to yourself and saying your situation means you're cursed. And yet God says he's with you. God says you're blessed. Number three, not only are we dazed and disturbed, we find difficulty. And if we're honest, the truth is, we can make things worse. I don't know about you, but when I'm in a hurry, I respond so much better. Don't you drive better when you're in a hurry and when you're stressed and frustrated, right? Don't you react to your children more properly when you're irritated and freaked out? Do you get the idea here? So sometimes the difficulty is not just outward. Let's be honest. Sometimes the difficulty is inward. This is how the birth of Jesus Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law. 
and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. He wanted to put her away. See, when life happens and life is hard, oftentimes we try to make our own plans. We think, I'm going to fix this. That person won't respond the right way. I'm going to send an angry letter. You just want Facebook. I got to answer that. I got to give them. I got to let give them a big. By the way, you don't have to. Because can I just be honest with you? Especially if it's a political thing, nobody's really convinced of your answer online. I'm just. I, I know you're the smartest person ever, but we make our own plans. I don't know about you, but I always loved The Incredible Hulk when I was a kid. Anybody ever watched the Bill Bixby version of Hulk? You know what I'm talking about? It started out with the, you know, he's zapping himself, and it ends with, he has to leave again. You know, and he leaves, right? And sad. But what happens in between? He's somewhere, and somebody picks on him, and he doesn't have to take it. He's not going to take it. No, he's not going to. He's not going to take it anymore. And so that happens, and he is, he is there, right? And somebody picks at him, and what happens? You're thinking, oh, you don't want to make him angry. And then he looks up, and he goes, you don't want to make me angry. And then what happens? Colored contacts. <laughs> the white contacts. Right? And then you're like, oh, you've done it now, right? And then what happens? He turns green, and his problems are solved by anger. They're solved by physical force. They're solved by all these things. But can I tell you the truth? That is not how God works. God does not solve your problems by you being stronger, by be you being, being louder, by you being angrier. And when we try to solve life the way we want, we ruin it. We make it work. Instead, we have to trust God. Instead, we have to wait on God. God could have told Joseph first. Do you realize that? God could have gone to Joseph and said, by the way, Mary's pregnant. Mary would figure it out. <laughs> he could have started with Joseph and then Joseph said, by the way, Mary, angel appeared last night. You're pregnant. I am? Yep. Let me tell you what he told me. Right? And then she'd be like, you're crazy. Wait a second. But instead... Told Mary first. Mary had to go tell Joseph. Does that sound like fun to anybody? Uh, Joseph, I just, you know, last night an angel appeared to me and uh, I'm pregnant. He had to at least think she was crazy. On the best of days, think she was crazy. Does that sound like a blessing? And yet, even in this, she's highly favored. Now let me tell you about the God of the Bible, because I don't know about you, I tend to think, God, you're going to do things my way. So let me just give you a few examples from Scripture. The God of the Bible is the one who threw Joseph and had Joseph thrown in jail. Had Joseph dragged away from his brothers so he could learn. The God of the Bible is the one that said, I'm releasing you from Egypt. And as they went to cross the Red Sea, he said, nah, we're not going to open it yet. I don't know about you, I like God to do what I want. So I would like the Red Sea open, nice and dry, Pharaoh's army wiped out. I want life to go the way I want it to. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fiery furnace. Remember the fiery furnace? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego looked at the king and they said, King, our God will save us. And they did a very middle child answer at this point, by the way. Our God will save us. And then they said, but even if he doesn't, that was kind of like the, we're going to have faith in God. But just in case, we want to let you know, we're not serving you anyway. I am sure as the soldiers, who by the way died as they were throwing them into the furnace, as those soldiers were, I guess they counted, right? One. I'm sure Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego were thinking, okay, God, any time. Two. Okay, now we'd be good. Three. Well, I guess we're doing part two, right? <laughs> Why does God wait for the furnace? Why does God wait for Joseph to know? Why does God not do things the way I think he should? How about you? Because in the middle of all those things, he teaches us to trust him. David and Goliath, you ever think about that story? David had to basically stand up in front of all these other soldiers who were much bigger and well-trained. David was such a wimp 
in the eyes of his father that he didn't even go to battle. He was the lunch cart. His dad said, bring your brother's lunch. Feed them because they got fighting to do. And David came and said, I'll go against Goliath. Saul, big old Saul said, yeah, let me try my armor on. Oh, that's not working. It's okay, I'll get, so imagine, he had to get rock as Goliath yelled. Listen, the Goliaths in your life will always yell and scream and tell you why you're not important, tell you why you can't do something, but don't let the Goliaths in your life keep you from accomplishing God's will. And then finally, number four, this is what we do once we give up. We get dazed, disturbed, we find difficulty often, and then we finally we depend on him for strength. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth and Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David. By the way, all those things fulfilled Old Testament prophecy. And then he said, because he belonged to the house and line of David, he went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths. I don't know about you, but what do you mean? She didn't wrap him in royalty? And placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. So let's go back. He's at the town of David. Everyone related to Joseph was there. Every, it's not that boring, every family member he knew was there, and yet the Bible says there was no room. So that meant that at nine months pregnant, Mary had to ride a donkey miles and miles, let's make it worse, to be taxed. Anybody enjoy paying taxes here? It, I just love it. I can't leave it, right? No, nobody does, right? They have to go. They have to pay taxes. Then they can't find a room. Why? Because the family said, you're not welcome here. They go to an innkeeper, and the innkeeper says, you know what? Out back, I've got a cave. Some people think that's where the, the Passover lambs were. We have no idea. It sounds really good, but the Bible doesn't really tell us that. There's a story about a little Down syndrome boy. I love the story. A little preschooler, and they were doing the Mary and Joseph play, and he was to be the innkeeper. And his only line was, no room in the inn. So the little Mary and Joseph in practice came up, and they came up to the innkeeper, and they said, can we have a room? And he said, no room in the inn. And the little Mary and Joseph wandered off. Well, the time, night of the performance came. The parents were so nervous that he wouldn't get his line down. And the little Mary and Joseph, you know, very sadly came up and said to the innkeeper, can we have a room? And the little boy got his line right. No room in the inn. His parents were so proud. They were like, yes. But as the little Mary and Joseph walked over, the little boy was down and said, wait, you can have my room. <laughs> So we read the story and we think how we would change it, but the truth is Mary and Joseph just had to trust God. And I'll be honest with you, do you know why we trust God sometimes? Because we're out of other options. We finally get to the point where we've dealt with things, where things happen, where we say, I'm going to trust God. So here's some keys to what to do when God doesn't do what I expect. By the way, does anybody, does God, anybody in here, God always does exactly what you pray for. Anybody in here? God always does exactly what I pray for. Anybody? Anybody? Nobody? Always does what I pray for. Here's what it says. Listen. Number one, if you want to get his strength, if you want to move to that last point, here's three things you can do. Number one, rest in God's peace, even in confusion. You ever have that point in life where you're just like, God, I don't understand. Why would you let that person die? God, why would I have to deal with this physical thing? Lord, why did you put that person in my family? Lord, why did you let Paul come to our church? I mean, all of these things. I had to call you out at least once. You know, all, you know, all of these things. We say, you know, God, why would you let that happen? But can I tell you that sometimes we just don't know? I still don't have a good answer for why God didn't open the Red Sea ahead of time. I still 
don't have a good answer to a parent who loses a child. I still don't have a good answer to why is my loved one in the hospital right after this. I still don't have a good answer as why do I have this diagnosis. I still don't have a good answer. But what I know is that the God of all comfort can comfort anyone. Philippians 4 says this, don't worry about anything. How are you doing with that verse? You probably can just take that section and put it on a billboard, and that would be your verse of the year. Don't worry about anything, but uh, pray about everything. Tell God your needs, and don't forget to thank him. Notice what it says here, for his answers. He doesn't say for your answers. For his answers. If you do this, you'll experience God's peace which is far more wonderful than the human mind can understand. His peace will keep your thoughts and your hearts quiet and at rest as you trust in Christ Jesus. You know what that means? That even when you don't know the answer, you can have rest. Even when you don't know the answer, you can have peace. See, when you pray, my will be done, you don't have peace. When you pray, thy will be done, you have peace. Thy will be done is not easy. Me sitting in the hospital and saying, God, I'm your vessel. If you want to put me on the shelf, you can put me on the shelf. I would love to tell you I did that because I'm so spiritual. I did that because I didn't have a choice. I said, God, you're in charge. I, I, thy will be done. We all have to get to the thy will be done stage. And that's when God says, okay, here's peace. If you get a chance, read Luke chapter 1 and look at Mary's song. She remembered what God had done and remembered what he did do. Not thinking about her own problems, not thinking about what was coming up, not thinking about the difficulties ahead, but thinking about how she was blessed that God would use her. Number two, release your pace for God's pace. I honked at somebody on the way to church this morning. I know. I know. We're, I was sitting at the light down here on 524, and the light turned green, and the light turned green, and I sat, and I sat, and I finally just went, beep. That was you. And the person went like, <laughs> and, the person, and the person waved their hand at me, and then went. I always debate how long is long enough for somebody to sit in a green light before I encourage them. I. I don't know about you, I like my pace better than yours. If, if I'm on I-95 and you pass me, you're a maniac. And if you're going too slow and you're in the left lane, you're an idiot. Why? Because my pace is perfect, isn't it? Isn't yours? We all think our pace is perfect. Jesus, disciples, Jesus get ready to go back into heaven. The disciples say, so, are you setting up your kingdom now? Here's what Jesus says to them. This is my final words. He says, it is not for you to know the time or the dates the Father has set by his own authority. And then you read a little late, right after that, he goes, see ya. You know, you're going to receive power. See ya. You mean we're not going to know everything? No. you got to let him set the pace. I don't know about you. God's never fast enough for me. I don't like waiting. But he calls us to wait. In Exodus 14, 14, my favorite Old Testament passage is at the Red Sea. The Lord will fight for you. You need only be still. It's my favorite passage because it's the hardest one to learn. Number three, lastly today, relax. Knowing that he's preparing all for your good. Regardless of what's happening in your life right now, I'm not saying that the cancer diagnosis you got is good. I'm not saying that what that person did to you in the past is good. I'm not saying that what happens to you is good. I'm not saying that evil person that's attacking you is good. But I'm saying that God can even use that for your good. I wish you could go with me to the hospital sometime when I walk into a room where someone has just had major surgery. And I'm able to say, wow, I know right where you're at. And they don't say it. No, you don't. I'm able to say, so are they doing this for you? In a few days, you might get depressed. I just want you to know, I've had so many surgeries. After about three days, I tended to get depressed. You might not, but I always did. And I'm able to help people out of the hurt that I had. You're able to help people out of the hurt that you've had. And we know that in all things, God works for the good. It doesn't say all things are good, but he works them for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. Basically, if you're a believer and you're saying, God, I want to fulfill your purposes, you fulfilled this scripture. 
For those God foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. By the way, the purpose is not for you to have an easy life. It's for you to be conformed to his image. A manger was not an easy place to have a baby. A stable did not smell good. I'm sure if we walked up on that stable today, we would go, Ooh. and yet that's what God showed. That he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. When God doesn't do things the way we expect, we're dazed, disturbed, and we find difficulty, and then finally we depend on him. I want to encourage you to learn to rest in his peace. Learn to release your own pace and relax, knowing that he's preparing all for your good. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Christ, we don't do a formal invitation where people come forward, but I'll be here after the service and you say, Eric, I want to surrender my life to him. Maybe you need to take that next step of faith in baptism and you don't understand everything. You don't have to understand everything. If you've given your life to Christ, you take that next step. We've got a sign-up sheet out there. You can sign up for baptism. Maybe as I was speaking today, one of the points, you just felt like God said, that one's for you. <laughs> That's the one today to say, God, would you help me with that area of my life today? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for this time. I thank you for your word and your power. I thank you for doing what only you can do. Lord, even when things are hard and when life doesn't go the way we want, we pray that you, Father, by your spirit, would give us comfort and life and love that we would know your presence even here now. Father, for that one today who's struggling with something major, that something that feels major, Father, I pray right now that they would know your presence, that they would know that they are favored, that you have given them your grace, and that one day they'll be in your presence with no more pain or suffering or hurting or pain. Lord, we thank you for this time. Lord, I pray that today as we give our offerings, our, our finances, I pray that you would bless every dime that's given. Thank you for how you've blessed our church and continue to bless us.